Yeah, well, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I realise sitting down in these seats that when they built this place in the 60s or whatever it was, I don't think they designed it for the afternoon type of, time of the day, eh? Those light, the sun coming through those, the window at the top there, eh? As beautiful as it is, it's always awkward where you're, where you're sitting there. So I appreciate you guys suffering through uh, for the sake of the afternoon. Um, yeah, my name is Aaron. Uh, I have the privilege of serving as youth pastor here at Rally Street. I've been here for just over six years now. And um, one of the most amazing things that I get to be a part of is, is running and being part of events where the gospel is preached in a really simple and clear way in order for people to better respond to that, that message. And we had an event just a couple of Fridays ago here in the main auditorium, an event called Unashamed. And Unashamed was uh, put on by an evangelist. He's uh, here, he's a Kiwi, he's based in the Hawks Bay, but he travels around the country. His name's Luke Collis. And he brings in some musical artists and different people and gets them together in order to shape a night so that young people can hear the gospel, both through the preaching of the word, through music and through spoken word and through different ways. And then offered an opportunity to put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ. And so two Fridays ago, we had this event here. We had about 180 teenagers here from Cambridge and Hamilton and the surrounding areas. Um, and on that night, of the 180 that were sitting down there listening to the gospel, over half of them got up to respond to the gospel message. And it was just such a powerful moment where the Holy Spirit was working um, through the whole night to call people back to himself, to call people back to the Father. And it was really cool to see. Now, for some of those young people, many from our church, um, some of them responded for the very first time. Um, and a bunch of them responded uh, kind of as a recommitment to say that, hey, I've been getting really distracted by life lately, and I just want to refocus and recommit myself back to God and trust in Him. And it was such an awesomely powerful night. We have these types of events all the time uh, in youth ministry, I think. You know, youth ministries are kind of big on events. We have camps. We've got Easter camp coming up real soon. Um, and so, hey, if you're not doing anything for Easter and you want to help out, we've got lots of ways, lots of camps in the area that would love some extra helpers for the weekend. Um, so you can chat with myself or Jeremy or, or someone about getting involved. We'd love to have you help out. But through those camps in different ways, we want to preach the gospel in order for young people and for people to respond to that message in order to come to know uh, Jesus as their Lord and Saviour. And last week, uh, Jeremy Susted, I assume he came out in the afternoon service and, and shared with you really what this gospel message is in a really simple and clear way. And he, and he preached from that John 3.16 passage, that God so loved the world, both the, the physical world, the material world, but also the people in the world, that whoever would believe uh, will not perish but have eternal life. And in that is just a really simple message to every single person that they can believe and trust in Jesus and respond to him and be given new life. Now, Jeremy said we had a baptism at around just after three o'clock for one of our young guys, Lennon, who's over here, um, who's just become a Christian like within the last six months. And it's just like the Bible says, I got to get baptized. So I got to get baptized. Um, in fact, yesterday, I saw him and he's like, it has to be tomorrow, Aaron. And so we made it work. So real cool to see. If you want to hear about his story, he loves telling it. And I only say that because I don't know if he does, but he will from now on. So you can go and ask him afterwards and uh, he can share a bit about his story. Events are really good and they absolutely have their place in church. Those opportunities for large nights where we can get um, speakers and people who are trained and musicians and all those kinds of people to come in. But we can't run them all the time. We can't run outreach events every day of the week because it's a lot of admin, it's a lot of work, and we can't actually run events that appeal to every person. We could, but it would be a lot of work and a lot of effort, and probably the fruit of it might not continue as it does on a night like that. You know, I was sharing with the group this morning, you know, like we had a rap group that was there that night called Blessed One, and a bunch of our young people were like, Blessed One, yes, this is awesome, let's go out to that. But if I mentioned to you that there's a Christian rap group coming to perform, a bunch of you would be like, well, whatever, I'm not going to that, that sounds horrible, right? Um, kind of thing. And that's totally fine, right? On the flip side, if we were like, hey, there's a symphony orchestra coming to play and we're going to preach the gospel, our young people would just be like, no, thank you. Now, there are definitely, I can see some families whose kids would love that and I totally get that. But for the most part, our teenagers would not respond to a night like that. But maybe some of you would. But we can't run events based on interests and, and keep that as a sustainable way of evangelizing and sharing the gospel with people. But there is a better way, and I'm going to share that way with you this afternoon, and it's called relational evangelism. And one of the things with relational evangelism is that it, what it does is it takes it out of the space of having to invite people 
to a particular building at a particular time based on a particular thing that's going on and hoping that they'll respond to someone standing up the front and preaching the gospel. Those are really good things. And many of us probably growing up in the church or or many of us who, who maybe didn't grow up in the church have responded to events in that way. Maybe it was at an outreach event. You know, there's probably a few people old enough here to remember the Billy Graham era and the Crusades and those types of things where we filled, like the Waikato Stadium was filled with people responding to the gospel. And in fact, I saw the other day a comparison. I didn't, I can't remember exactly what the comparison was, but between who showed up to a Taylor Swift concert and who showed up to a Billy Graham concert. And I think Billy Graham actually edged Taylor Swift out for attendance when he went to Australia in comparison to Taylor, Taylor Swift. So, yeah, just FYI. So maybe as sad as you think it is when 90,000 people show up to Taylor Swift, just remember that there was a time that people, more people showed up to gospel. But we don't have a Billy Graham. We don't, we don't have those events anymore. So what can you do? How do you structure your life in a way that is missional? How do you structure your life in a way that is um, to evangelize to those people that are around you? Now, one of the things that we often talk about in Christian circles is um, this idea of apologetics, right? So apologetics is um, having really great answers for tough questions about the Christian faith, being able to rationalize the facts that the Bible presents in a way that people are going to understand. So like the resurrection for Jesus, for example, that is an unbelievable event because we don't see people rising from the dead on a daily basis. So the fact that Jesus did it is kind of pretty crazy. So how do we have evidence that a man who lived 2,000 years ago suddenly rose from the dead three days after being put in the ground? You need those evidences, not only for our belief, but to convince others. And so facts and evidences are really, really important. And uh, Sam Chan, he's got this book called How to Talk About Jesus Without Being That Guy. We all know that guy, right? That guy that talks about Jesus and you're like, could you just... All right, you're, you're probably doing more harm than good and sharing about Jesus, right? We want to share about Jesus without being that guy. I really encourage you to read this book. It's, it's not, long, uh, not long. I think the audio book is about 245 minutes. I think the page book is 150-odd pages. So um, and, and probably five or six years ago, I would have been like, that's a really long book. Okay, It's not that long of a book. Young people, read it. It's really good. In his book, he talks about this, why actually people believe. And he says that facts and evidence and data are actually really weak in making something believable. Okay? So facts, evidence, and data are actually weak in making something believable. So let's take a a piece of evidence, for example. So last year, the South Africans won the Rugby World Cup, right? Boo, oh, yuck. Right? Okay. Now, most of us, if we polled most, most, most of us here, most of us in New Zealand, we would still claim that the All Blacks are the best rugby team in the world. We would still wholeheartedly believe that. Now, the facts and evidence are currently the All Blacks probably aren't the best team in the world, but they're our team. And so based on where we grew up, we would say that they are the best team in the world still. You know, Or if we said, what is the greatest rugby team to ever play? We would probably point to maybe the 2015 All Blacks or something. The South Africans might point to the 2023 South Africans. But it's actually the facts and evidence would say that right now, All Blacks are not the best rugby team in the world because we lost the World Cup. And I'm not even sure if we hold the number one ranking. I don't know who's number one in the world at the moment. The facts that image otherwise, but I'm not going to admit to that because I'm a, I'm a Kiwi. We believe in the All Blacks, right? He says that the most important thing in determining belief in something is actually your community. It's actually the people that you rub shoulders with, the people in your family, those that you trust the most, those that love you, that express love to you, that you express love to them. When they hold to a certain belief, you are more inclined to hold to that belief as well. And a lot of us who are Christians, I'm a Christian who grew up in the church. My parents are Christians. My grandparents are Christians. My great-grandparents were Christians. My uncles, my great-uncles, my cousins. Right? I, I had to go and marry a Canadian just to make sure that I wasn't marrying someone related to me. Okay? That's how many Christians I have in my family. All right? That like I can go somewhere and probably with about two degrees of separation find a relation. All right? That's just the unfortunate nature of the lot that God had for me in my life. But the Christian faith, although I had to go through that time period as a, as a teenager and as a young adult to really search out and figure out if this was true and believable, 
When I read the evidence for it, it was way more believable because everyone around me believed it. It just made sense. When I was trying to figure out the worldview of the Bible and why the world is the way that it is, Genesis makes sense to me as to why the world is the way that it is. When I look at the fall and I look at the fact that as humanity we decided to eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and now since then have chosen for ourselves what we think is right or wrong, that makes sense for me when I look around the world that I'm in. When I see the world continually go down a degrading space and I was in an argument with someone one day about how we've come so much further and life is so much better now because you know we eradicated slavery and that type of thing. And I actually had to say to him, I, I think the stats are saying that there's more slaves in the world today than there was back during the African slave, um, the African American slave trade. So are we? We might say we're more enlightened, but we probably aren't. And so these things were much more believable for me. Sam Chan in his books talks about this idea of plausibility structures. Okay? So the amount of people in your life that believe something or hold to something, the more likely you are to believe that as well. Now here's the thing when it comes to us talking about evangelism and sharing the gospel. You might be the only Christian in your co-worker's life. You might be the only Christian with your friends that you're, that you're in your sports teams with, that you're in your clubs with, that you're in your book club, whatever those types of things are. You might be the only Christian in that space. And so when you pipe up and you talk about a miraculous God who created the world, uh, uh, who sent his son to die on the cross and rose again three days later, you're as crazy as the person who's been abducted by aliens. Because you're the only one that believes it. The plausibility of your belief is really low. Because maybe in the world and in the people that you rub shoulders with, you're the only one who holds that belief. Now what our hope is, is as Christians, is that we want to make the gospel and the Bible as believable as possible to those that don't already know it. Right? We want to make it as believable as possible. And so one of the ways that we want to do that is we're going to talk about your universes. And I'm sure if I said to you, hey, think about people who are in your Christian universe, your church, your home group, your youth group, wherever you're serving, your family, you've got those people. And that's awesome. And we, spend, we love to spend time with them. We love them to be around our kids. We love them to be around our people. Those things are really good. Maybe your whole Sunday is dedicated to that, that circle. And then in a Monday to Saturday, Monday to Friday kind of a space, you have your non-Christian world, your co-workers, Maybe some schoolmates from back in the day. Maybe schoolmates for right now. And in that world, you're the only Christian. The, the belief message of the Bible, the, the believability of the Bible is just is too hard to believe. And we want to chat this afternoon about merging your two universes together. Merging those two worlds together. Because the more people that believe in Jesus that you can put around your friends and family and co-workers that don't know Jesus the more believable it will become when you begin to have those conversations about the gospel. And I actually think that if I said to you right now, could you write down people in both of those worlds, that you probably could quite easily think about that. Maybe God's already been placing on your heart some non-Christians that are in your life that you're like, oh, I, I do want to have a conversation with them. I'm just not really sure how to go about it. I don't really want to wreck the friendship that I have. I don't want to wreck the relationship that I, that I have. I don't want to make work really awkward. Well, what we want to do is I'm going to give you a couple of questions. And this is going to be an opportunity for you, actually. We're going to give you a couple minutes to actually, maybe you've grabbed a piece of paper as you came in, you got a pen or you got your phones on you, you want to write some notes down in this way. But I'm going to challenge you to actually think about those people in your world and some ways in which you can connect them. The first is by thinking about what actual hobbies, interests, things that you love to do. What are things that you love to do? There's a group that um, started, I'm trying to think what, when it started, Dirt Church work. When, how long ago did that start? Was it pre-COVID? Five years ago. Yeah, yeah. So about five years ago, um, a guy named Marty decided to start running this thing called Dirt Church on a Monday night up at the Tamiro uh, Mountain Bike Club. And it's not dirt church in the sense of sitting in the dirt and, um, you know, doing church. It's like, we're going to go mountain biking, we're going to have some food together, and then we're going to talk about the Bible. 
Now, the concept is not just to get a bunch of believers who love mountain biking to get together, but it's actually to go, hey, work, you love mountain biking, come out and mountain bike with us. But also maybe you've got some non-Christian friends who love mountain biking. We'll invite them to come along as well. If they want to hang around for the Bible study, they can hang around for the Bible study. If they want to duck away, that's fine. But what you start doing is you start bringing those two worlds together. Now all of a sudden your friend who loves mountain biking goes, oh, there's like 15 other people that love mountain biking and talk about this Jesus dude. Maybe there's something to this all of a sudden. And so I wonder what it would be for you. I wonder what that hobby or that interest or that thing you like doing. Maybe it's drinking coffee. Awesome. Drink coffee with Christians and non-Christians. Do you like eating food? I like eating food. Awesome. Invite someone around for a meal and have someone from church come around and have someone from your work or your friendship group who's not a Christian to come around at the same time. Don't feel like we have to keep our bubbles in that separate space. So I'm going to actually give you a couple of minutes to think about people that you know that are Christians, people that you think that you know that you know that are not Christians, and some ways that you can start bringing them together. I'm actually going to give you a couple of minutes to do that now. So whip your phones out, write some notes down, write it on a piece of paper, whatever you need to do, because that's the challenge for the week, right? I'm going to give you two minutes to uh, to get into that. <laughs> Cool. I hope that's helpful. Don't leave that thought process here in this room. Continue it when you're finished here. Go and find someone else in this room who has similar interests and hobbies to you. Start chatting about how you can bring your friends together. You know, one of the things that I found growing up in the church was that we had kind of, we had, I did things with my Christian people and then I did things with my non-Christian people and I was always trying to get my non-Christian people to come to these events that my non-Christian, that my Christian people were running, right? So those outreach events and youth group and things like that. But it just for them, they were like, that's just weird. Going to church on a Wednesday night, that's weird. Going to church on a Sunday morning, that's just weird. I'm sleeping on a Sunday morning. Why would I, why would I wake up and go to church? And so what you want to start doing is actually thinking about your whole world. Not just the times that you're in this building. Not just the times that you've got Bible study or home group that you're going along to. But what are those things in your world that God has given you? What are those gifts and interests that God has given you? And how can you use them to reach those people who are near you already, that God has placed in your world already? I'm going to read for you a few verses from Acts chapter 2. And I think this is really important for us to to really think about how God uh, uses community in order to reach people who are lost. Now, we know that in Acts chapter 2, that the majority of that chapter is, uh, is Pentecost. Okay? Pentecost was the, the time 50 days after the ascension of Jesus when the Holy Spirit arrives on the disciples and on the believers. And Peter gets up in front of this huge congregation of Jews and presents to them the gospel. Presents to them the reason that Jesus is the Messiah and why they need to repent and turn and believe. And in response to that amazing moment, 3,000 people were added to the church that day, on that very moment. Now, we can't replicate Pentecost. 
We can't replicate what Jesus has done there. We can try. We do events like I was talking about unashamed. We can do those things, but they're not things that we can do on a regular, sustainable basis. But Jesus didn't stop, or God didn't stop adding numbers to the church after Pentecost, after Peter's sermon. It says in verse 42 of Acts chapter 2 that they were devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Reverential awe came over everyone and many wonders and miraculous signs came about by the apostles. All who believed were together and held everything in common and they began selling their property and possessions and distributing the proceeds to everyone as anyone had need. Every day they continued to gather together by common consent in the temple courts, breaking bread from house to house, sharing their food with glad and humble hearts, praising God and having the goodwill of all the people. And the Lord was adding to their number every day those who were being saved. I mean, we could do a whole sermon on that short passage of scripture about how Christian community is supposed to look. But effectively what's happening there and what I want to get us to get out of that is that when we live in Christian community, when we live community the way that God calls us to live, in that idea of sharing and caring for one another and sacrificially giving to one another, that it's actually through that that the Lord continued to add numbers every single day. We don't need a Pentecost. We don't need an unashamed event. We don't need these big things. Because when we care for one another and the people are seeing that, the Lord will draw his people in. The Lord will draw unbelievers in. And so that's my challenge for you as you think about those two universes. When you begin to bring your non-Christian friends and your Christian friends or your co-workers or whoever those are together in a relational way, that you will start having opportunities for better gospel conversations. You're going to put your, your non-Christian friends and those people in that space in a much better space where the, the believability of the gospel is now higher in their life. And I can all... Surely we can all say that that's something that we would want for those that are around us who don't believe in Jesus. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to run through a few quick tips for better gospel conversations. A few quick tips. Now this comes from Sam Chan's book, How to Talk About Jesus. These are quite literally just his chapter headings, okay? And again, it's a small book. I would encourage every single person here to pick it up and read it at some point in time. We're not going to have time to get into everything, but we're just going to hit a few of them as we go through. The first off is go to their things and they'll come to your things. All right? So you've got non-Christian friends and they want to go to a band and maybe you're like, oh, I don't really know if I want to go to that band. Go. They want to go to a pub quiz? Go to a pub quiz. They want to go watch the rugby? Go watch the rugby. Go along to their things. Because then when it's Easter or when it's Christmas Eve or when there's something happening at church that you're like, man, they would probably really enjoy coming along to. When you invite them, it's now just a part of your relationship. You go to your, their things, they go to your things. If their kids have stuff on, go along with them. Your kids have stuff on, invite them along. We got a bunch of single young adults in the afternoon service. You guys have probably the most amount of free time as anyone sitting in this room, all right? Okay. Use it wisely. You're going to go for an adventure in an overnight camp? Invite your non-Christian friends along and your Christian friends along. Your non-Christian friends invite you to something and you're like, oh, I'm not 100% sure, maybe. Just go and see what God will do with it. When you go to their things, they'll come to your things. Second there, coffee, dinner, gospel. It's just a way of framing going. Coffee is the concept of like a 15 to 20 minute conversation. Hey, what's going on in your life? How are the kids? How is work, how's study, how's your friendships, whatever, surface level 15 to 20 minute conversations. Then you want to move to dinner. Dinner is more intimate. You're inviting them into your house. You're going to spend more like an hour to two hours with them. You start asking them about their childhood, about where they grew up, about different things like that. And then eventually you get an opportunity to share the gospel with them. So uh, coffee, surface level, dinner, worldview conversations, and then you get an opportunity to present the gospel. Cool? The golden rule of evangelism. Evangelize to others as you wish to have them evangelize to you. Okay? Right? Golden rule. Do unto others as you would have them do to you. Same with evangelism. How would you want to be evangelized? Not that any of us are going to convert to another religion because we're super strong believers, obviously. But if someone was trying to convince you, how would you want them to do that? I'd want them to ask me lots of questions. I'd want them to listen to what I'm saying. I'd want them to genuinely know who I am. 
So do the same to your non-Christian friends. Tell better stories. Tell better stories. Jeremy just started an elective in the morning service in the morning time at the moment, which is on how to share your own story. Learn how to tell what God has done in your life. Not just your like conversion moment, but what was the last time that God answered a prayer in your life? Tell those stories. Tell the stories when you were down and the church came along and supported you and raised you up. Tell better stories. Tell stories about Jesus. Ultimately, we need to share who Jesus is. We see that when we read through the Gospels in particular, that every person who comes into contact with Jesus has something happen to them. Now, not everyone responds and becomes a disciple. I totally get that. But there was something about Jesus. We also know that um, in Scripture, in Romans chapter 1, it says that it is the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ, that is the power for salvation. So we actually need to be moving to a point of telling stories about Jesus. So that means that we need to know stories about Jesus, doesn't it? Become the unofficial de facto chaplain. Right? So you're going to have people in your life who are going through really tough times. Do they see you as a person that they can come and confide in? that they can come and share with, and you're going to be a listening ear, that you're going to offer to pray for them, that you're going to offer to speak life into what they're going through. Become their de facto chaplain. I want to share one little story actually about that. We live up the road here on the corner of Burns and Browning Street. And um, right off our back fence, we have an amazing group of young boys who love loud cars. Okay? So the traditional word for them is a bogan, all right? So that's the traditional word for our neighbors. We have bogan neighbors, all right? The guy who owns the house is like, I was 23 when we moved in, so he's about 25 years old now, okay? And I think he went to school with Javen. I think I've had this chat with you about him. So he's a youngish guy. We moved in. He came and initiated a conversation with us. Crazy, right? Dudes in their mid-20s don't often come and initiate conversations with young families. Um, but he came over. Hello, how are you doing? Hey, if you need any help with your car or whatever you need, just come and see me. Awesome. Great. Open door. My car's broken. Come and have a look at it. No. It's like, hey. But he came and initiated a conversation. Over a little while, Jess gave him some pumpkin pie at Christmas time. We had conversations. We were engaging with them. I didn't come look at my car. I went and looked at their cars. You know, you have these kind of relationships going on. Jess actually called me at work one day. Aaron, there's police and ambulance next door. Oh. Boom, pick up my phone. Jaden, bro, what's going on? I heard there's some emergency services at your house. Oh, yeah. One of my flatmates, uh, we just found him in his room. He's been dead for a couple of days. All right? And you go, okay, now what do we do? What do we do in this situation? What do you need, bro? Do you guys need food, pizza? Can I come and pray for you? What do you need? His response, actually, if you can pray for the house, that'd be great. Yep. So I, called, so I popped around early, then went back, and then came back later on. All right, man, let's get in the room. And we just prayed over the room. When you're in people's lives, when you see that they're in need, take that initiation and reach out. Become their de facto chaplain. Become that priest, right? First Peter tells us that every single believer is part of the priesthood. We all have a role. Be that to your non-Christian friends, family, and neighbors. Finally, lean into disagreement. I have a couple of high school mates who aren't believers. Um, one was raised in a really weird church um, and has walked away from it. Another mate who's, um, I actually had the privilege of baptizing him when we left school, but has since walked away from the faith and, and doesn't really believe in it much. Again, I think that community aspect for him was huge. He went off to university, didn't really enjoy the church he was going to and kind of walked away. We will sit and have conversations about Jesus and the gospel, our worldviews and those types of things, and all three of us are sitting there in disagreement. But I don't walk away from that. I press and I ask questions. And I have a friend of mine, this one who once was a believer and has walked away. He's a firm believer that um, everyone can only do what's presented before them, so in innately everyone's good. Oh, okay, so was Hitler right or was Hitler wrong? Well, he could only do what was before him. So in his own eyes, he's right. Oh, so what he did was right. We literally had a 20-minute conversation going, dude, you're supportive of what Hitler did. 
Well, nah, yeah, nah, yeah. And like he actually had to come to this point where his worldview was shaped in a way that he would allow that and say, well, yeah, that was right for Hitler, so then that's right. Because he had no morals to stand on. He had no way of saying what's right and what's wrong. We had to lean into that disagreement. And in response, I got to go, well, actually, there is justice and there is truth and there is morality. And it comes from something higher than just what we think it is. And we got to lean into those conversations and into that disagreement. Um, I just want to close with this, which is a little bit of a warning. In the pursuit of reaching your friends and your family, your colleagues, your neighbors for the gospel, you are going to face opposition. Because the devil does not want you to reach unbelievers with the gospel message. The Bible talks about it in, this, in two different ways. First of all, those who haven't trusted in Jesus are dead in their transgressions and dead in their sins. But God makes them alive. So we're in the business of making dead people alive. The devil doesn't want that. Another way that the Bible talks about it is that those who are without God are living in the world of darkness and ruled by the kingdom of darkness, the prince of darkness. But we are calling them to come into the light. If we are to move people from death to life and darkness, uh, death to life and darkness to light, there is going to be opposition about the one who rules that world. And I can assure you that it will come. Maybe it will look like a bit of bad luck. Maybe it will look like unfortunate coincidences. All these types of things might happen in your life and you're going, I don't really understand what's going on here. We've just had this recently, like I said, we had a big unashamed event, 180 teenagers here. And in the week to that event, we've had what I would say, not that I believe in luck, but I would say that was one of the unluckiest weeks that Jess and I and our family have had in a long time. We just had thing after thing after thing after thing trying to derail the week and tear us down and cause disruption in our life. Because ultimately, there is an enemy that is trying to stop us from doing these things. And so opposition will come. And I think I would fail as a pastor to not warn you about that. But he who is in us is greater than he who is in the world. Let me pray. Father, we thank you <clears throat> that you in your goodness and mercy and in your justice and righteousness sent your son to take the punishment on the cross that we couldn't take. Father, may we be a church, may we be a group of believers who doesn't kind of hold on to that for ourselves, but shares that with, uh, shares that with those that are around us. Help us, Lord, to have wisdom in bringing our two universes, our two worlds together in order to better have better gospel conversations. Father, give us boldness to take the initiative with those that don't know you. I pray that in our conversations as we finish here, you'll actually bring us together with others who have similar interests that maybe we can start doing this as well. I pray that our community be, will be one, that when people come to see what this is all about, that much like in Acts chapter 2, people will just see this and go, man, your God is amazing and I want to follow him. Thank you that your spirit is in us and empowers us and emboldens us and goes before us in all that we do. We pray for this in Jesus' mighty and powerful name. Amen. Amen. Looks like we've got the kids coming in.